Welcome to the Daily Bolster. Each day we welcome transformational executives to share their real world experiences and practical advice about scaling yourself, your team, and your business. Welcome to the Daily Bolster. I'm Matt Blumberg, co-founder and CEO of Bolster. And we are here uh, in deep today with Don Zier. Uh, Don is uh, someone I am proud to call a friend. Don and I served on a, a challenging board together for many years. Sure. Uh, Don was a senior executive uh, for a long time at Reader's Digest. She was chief executive officer of Nutrisystem. Uh, she is now a many time over public board member uh, and advisor and mentor and coach. And uh, Don, it's great to have you here. Great to be here, Matt. Thanks. So um, let's start very quickly. Give everyone a sense of the arc of your career, uh, because you did some very interesting and sort of different things on the road to becoming a public company CEO. Well, I always say it's rare the person whose career is a straight line, and my cer mine certainly wasn't. I started out as an electrical engineer, realized I didn't love it, um, but it was probably the best experience that prepared me for the way I like to think and for the way that I think actually made me successful as a CEO, which is steeped in data and analytics. Um, I then got my MBA, because when you don't like what you're doing, you go back to school and get your MBA. I, I did that and ended up doing banking for two years, credit card marketing at what was Chase Manhattan at the time, and then went to Reader's Digest, spent 20 years there, more than I ever thought, but it was a changing company, worked for four different CEOs over five years, got tapped then to become the CEO of Nutrisystem, did that, sold the company. Um, in the interim, built different a board portfolio, and today I'm doing a lot of board work, a lot of mentoring and coaching, which I love, and that's sort of the Reader's Digest condensed version. As it were. <laughs> Um, well, let's let's sort of pick one thing out of each phase. Uh, except maybe we'll skip the electrical engineering one, or we'll, <laughs> add, we'll do that on a five-minute version of the podcast right. some other time. Um, but uh, with Reader's Digest, you know, twenty years is a long time. It was a pretty good-sized company, obviously mm -hmm. an incredibly well-known brand. Um, probably a very different brand when you got there than when you left. Absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, I know you had some really interesting roles as a functional leader, as an international leader. Um, I, you know, one thing I'm curious about, I know, uh, you know, anyone who's anywhere for 20 years, um, runs into some difficulty, uh, right. Sure. Some, some hard moments. Um, and, um, you know, quite frankly, when you became a senior executive, there weren't tons of female senior executives in the world. Mm -hmm. So, um, you probably, uh, I'm guessing have a couple of interesting stories of, uh, you know, sort of facing down adversity. You know, I have to say, I've, I've been very lucky in my career. I've always had a lot of sponsorship, a lot of, and you're right, it was mostly a male-led leadership team, but I felt they were sponsors and advocates for me. And I feel like I was really lucky in that respect that I haven't experienced firsthand some of the things that many other people at other companies had. That's good. Um, I, I believe in the roles of mentors and sponsors and was fortunate, I think, because of, you know, hard work, dedication, passion to achieve that I was taken under the wings by several people and given opportunities, which which were really fantastic. Oh, that's great. That's great to hear. And, yeah. and, and I'm guessing something you've paid forward in your career. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, but as you think about the 20 years at Readers, um, what are, you know, sort of a couple moments that stood out like flashpoints or, uh, or, or difficult situations? Yeah, there were a couple. Um, I remember one of them was, you know, I, I worked for four different CEOs over a five year period. So that was a lot and learned things that I took on, took with me as I became a CEO, what I, as I, you know, created my own personal brand of what I wanted to be as a CEO, but I was working um, with Eric Schreier at the time, who was going from the president role to the CEO role of the company. And he told me he wanted to change my job. And I had always been in a role where I had vertical responsibility. I owned a whole, whole P&L and I loved it. And I loved you know, being accountable, you know, that engineers coming through again, give me the accountability. And he said he wanted to move me into a, a lateral staff role that would, instead of being responsible for the vertical, would be responsible for consumer marketing across the board. Hmm. And it was interesting because 
I remember saying, no, I, I like what I'm doing. I wanted to keep doing what I'm doing. And he's like, well, you know, he's the boss. That's not how it's going to be. But he did say to me, he goes, I want you to learn how to step outside your comfort zone. And that was really a pivotal moment for me. And he also said, I want you to, you're very strong with your power of your direct power when you own, you're an owner. And I want you to learn how to use your power of influence. And this role will teach you how to do that, how to bring up your soft skills in addition to your analytical rigor at you know, achieving the numbers. And I believe this will prepare you for greater things down the road. And when I look back, as I became a CEO, I think that role really was so important to me and learning as you move up in a company, it's about followership, being able to get followership, being able to influence, being able to have the right team around you to get things done without actually always having to be the one that does that or you know, driving it directly in a straight line down. So, but it was tough. It, it was tough moving, moving into that role. No, it's super interesting. Like when you're, look, when you, when you're used to having um, the PL responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, waking up one day without it has got to be a little bit jarring. And it, and it, what's interesting is that that proved to be uh, a springboard to being a CEO later and having a PL again, but with maybe a little more empathy or, or a different skill set. Right. And it's the matrix, it's the classical matrix right. organization. I was still responsible for the PL across all the marketing, but I wasn't the final voice in the verticals of how that got executed. Yeah. So it was different. But good, in retrospect, yeah. good, as most things are, I think, when you get time to reflect on changes that happen that may seem really pivotal at, pivotal at the moment. And when you reflect back on it, there's probably a lot of good that happens in those, even though it may be a transition and a little painful yeah. at the time. Now, you moved from that role into an international leadership role, um, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, the sequence. Um, how did that, how did you get from... <laughs> I think you're tapping into all, all my, uh, you're tapping into several of my, of my more challenging moments here, but again, where good things happened. So we had another CEO transition at Reader's Digest and um, the CEO at the time had promoted me into the global consumer marketing role. So essentially chief marketing officer across the entire company, again, you know, dealing with uh, working with in this matrix organization with different pillars of leaders that had the ultimate PL accountability. And we had a really good year. It was probably one of our best years. And then um, I remember being called into her office and she said, yeah, we're bringing in somebody that is going to be driving innovation and marketing that you'll report into. And I was like, I was, you were about to get later. Blindsided. I, I never saw it coming, never had happened to me before. My career path was always up, you know, and this was the first time it was something that I was viewing as negative was happening. And I remember thinking about it, I remember definitely not liking it. And then I remember, you know, talked to my husband a lot and we, we thought about what we, what would be best for me. And I thought I'd been at this company a long time. Maybe it's time to leave. And my husband, I remember having the conversation that, well, you don't fake resign. You know, a lot of people think it's a negotiation tactic. Anybody that does that, it's not, it should not be. It's, right. um, and I just like, went maybe, in, it, maybe it turns into one, but like you, if right, you but that's not the go in. Your head has to be in that. And I remember, you know, reflecting on it for about a month, being unhappy and then decided, you know, I'm going to go do something else. I'm, I'm young. I've been successful. Let me try that. And I went in and, and, essentially said I wanted to resign and wanted to have it be amicable and let's work through the details. And I remember being told, I'm not going to get rid of this person that I brought in. And I said, no, that's not what this is about. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm serious. I just think this is no longer the right role for me. Time for me to go spread my wings, do something else. So I went back to my office and the phone rang literally 10 minutes later. And she said, well, maybe we can go have breakfast tomorrow and talk. I'm thinking maybe, would you be open to running Europe? Again, that came totally out of the blue, totally unexpected. And I said, well, let me talk to my husband about it. And she said, would you move to London? And I said, no, because my kids were in high school. 
I said, but you know, what I'll do is I'll be, I'll be there, I'll go. And, you know, it's a lot of different countries. Ultimately I ended up accepting that offer, ended up running all of international for readers digest 26 different countries. Wow. And it, you know, and you can't be every time in every place at one time. So where you're located doesn't really matter if you don't need a lot of sleep. So <laughs> I did from New York turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me that came from a moment of extreme disappointment and was in my early forties, biggest time of professional growth for me turned into my biggest time of personal growth. I think shaped my kids into who they are today because they got a love for travel and a respect for the world that the world's a lot smaller place than you think when you're just sitting in your, in your hub in New York or something like that. Um, and was the best thing. So again, I think from these things that seem like crushing at the moment, really good things can happen. If you're open to that opportunity, open to the doors and open to conversations. And I really give um, that CEO a lot of appreciation and thanks for, didn't love that she made the change, but then it wasn't to get rid of me. It really was as she thought through it, you know, maybe do this other role, which turned into something that I think benefited the company and certainly was one of the best experiences I ever had in my professional career. And it's thanks to her. So yeah. really grateful. I mean, I, one of the key things you just said was being open, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, mm -hmm. open to new things, open to thinking differently, open to new opportunities. And, you know, you add that to talent and good things happen in your career for sure. Um, right. I think luck is made, is made, you know, people, I think people, there are people that are lucky, but I also think it's taking advantage of those opportunities that create luck and luck is a lot of hard work. And also there's luck to luck, but yeah. you know, a lot of hard work and discipline that go into that. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so let's fast forward now to Nutrisystem. So sure. you get hired as a public company CEO. You've never been a CEO of a freestanding company, let right. alone a public one. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with that transition. What were a couple of the things that were either challenging or were you know easy fits or things you had to learn uh, as you were transitioning to be a public company CEO? So one of the things that, and so I never was the public company CFO, ha, CEO, did not have Wall Street experience. So had to get that under my belt really quickly. And I remember one of the first questions investors would ask me, and investors generally don't mince their words, is why you? <laughs> and right. and yeah, makes me feel okay. like welcome, right? Why you? You're from publishing. You're from a magazine company. And I said, no, I am from a data and analytics company, probably one of the most sophisticated data and analytics companies at the time. And we happen to publish magazines, but what we do is we build revenue per customer. We build, we build continuity. We do all these things that are really relevant to Nutrisystem. And it's taking that skill set and bringing them forward with leadership that is going to make the difference here. And it's the marketing and the combination with data and analytics and, you know, building out Nutrisystem, which really was primarily an e-commerce company and bringing that to life. So that was the first thing was addressing, you know, do you belong here? And very quickly, the investors saw how it actually did make sense, but you had to reframe. And sometimes a lot of what you're doing when you're talking to the street or talking to teams, it's about reframing it in a way that really makes sense. No, I wasn't the magazine executive. I was the data and analytics executive with a marketing experience analytics that could dust brand. off a analytics tired brand. <laughs> yeah, but, and we needed to dust off a, a tired brand, which is what Nutrisystem system was. Well, and that's actually, I, you know, if I remember correctly, it was kind of a turnaround. Um, it definitely was. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we'd love to sort of hear what, what was that like doing a turnaround with the eye of Wall Street on you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times that's when companies decide to go private. They find, you know, a, a private equity firm to, so they can clean up in the quiet and then come back out again. Um, what was it like running a public turnaround? It required a lot of discipline. So again, I think this is where that engineering mindset came in. You know, one of the things we had to do was, you know, dust off the brand. I remember thinking, you know, we were number two in the space 
behind Weight Watchers. And we were never mentioned. If there was news, it would be, you know, at the time Bloomberg was looking to ban large gulp drinks at 7-Eleven or something like that. And they asked Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig to weigh in on that, no pun intended. And um, we weren't even part of the equation. So number one was to get ourselves back, back on the map in the consumer eye. And we had to also change what weight loss was about because the company had been run successfully for many years, but they never had a female CEO before. They never had a female CEO that had like most of the population struggled up and down with weight. And it had to change the mindset from it being a vanity play. The commercials I inherited were women in bikinis with fans blowing their hair back in stilettos that certainly were not aspirational to any 40 plus woman because it was unattainable for us yeah. and really had to change the messaging into it's about your health. It's about your being the best version of yourself. It's not about, you know, the vanity play, although that always is underlying, but we changed the messaging and that was really important. Next was bringing in the right team or having the right team. I correct myself. It was having the right team, which one of the things I learned during my time at Nutrisystem at Reader's Digest, having the benefit of working with many different CEOs is you have to be really careful not to create an us versus them culture. So you need to bring in new blood, but you also need to celebrate the people that are, are you're going to keep in the organization and really blend it into one team. I put a lot of effort into that and um, a lot of time into making the right leaders and making sure that we had the right team in place. And that's probably my proudest moment. And then the discipline of where are we going? We had to go get back to the fundamentals of marketing. It was a performance-based marketing organization. So I love that stuff. And you're know, really being, being able to measure, have the right moments, bring a little science into it. We were one of the first companies that used weight loss. Claim. I think we were the first company that used um, you know, weight loss claims with our fast five. And so it was really targeting the consumer message. It was a marketing play. It was about product innovation and having the right team in place and getting it done and making sure that we measured. And it was phenomenal. It, was, it wasn't easy, it was really hard, but we had a team that would wanted to be in the boat, would, would, would um, we sweated the details and we got it done and we created a lot of shareholder value. Stock went from seven to 42. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just, it's so impressive. You did that whole thing while public and um, you know, there, there must've been moments where it, it wasn't going well, right? Okay. There must've been hiccups along the way. Um, how were you able to bring the public markets along with you for, for a ride that took a while, right? It wasn't a turnaround mm -hmm. overnight. It was a few years of pretty hard work. I think it was about establishing credibility with the street, just like it's always about establishing credibility with your team. You have to be authentic. You have to show up as you say you're going to show up. And I brought in an amazing CFO, Mike Monahan, and together we we spent a lot of time with our investors, with our shareholders, with our analysts. And I think we built trust and credibility. You know, we weren't the schmoozy type of executives, and they trusted us and they let the story play out. Again, I brought in the right team and had the right team already in place and it, it made a difference. But there were moments, you know, the, the earnings call, they're fun until they're not fun. <laughs> so as long as the earnings call are going, they, ever fun? You know, they are, they actually are. When the stock, when the stock reacts after an earnings call and goes up, it's great fun. When it goes in the other direction, not so much. And you, you learn from those experiences and it's just about being transparent and accountable and then laying forward a path. And if you built that credibility and they believe that you'll deliver, um, generally it works out. Yeah, well, so now let's, let's uh, fast forward again. So you've moved from um, successful scaled public company CEO to a uh, board member and uh, you're on some very large and some very well-known boards. What, what's the inventory of boards right now? I'm on a couple right now. I'm on Spirit Airlines. Right which has been in the news. I'm on Hain Celestial, which is, um, they do Celestial tea, Sleepy Time tea, Terra Chips, a lot of different household brands. Yeah. I'm on Prestige Consumer Healthcare and Purple Innovation. Those are my public ones. And then I work with Go Henry, which is a private um, company 
in the um, about kids' financial education. Right. So pretty pretty wide range. Some interesting companies. Um, yeah, I like connecting the dots across industries. Yeah. No. It, I mean, that's that's one of the things that that uh, keeps it interesting. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so how so how did you make that move? And I know you had been on boards before, but mm -hmm. from being CEO, the one that's accountable to the board, to now being chair of some boards or chair of uh, significant committees on boards and sort of holding a management team accountable, holding a CEO accountable um, while not owning the problem, right? That's the hardest right. thing sometimes about a board member. It's like, it's not actually your problem. How, how do you make that mindset shift? Yeah, the, the phrase is noses in and fingers out, which is sometimes easier to say than do, especially when you have operators on the board. So when I was setting my board at Nutrisystem and working with my chair of the board, who was fantastic, Mike Hagan, you know, we were very deliberate in the type of people we wanted on the board. When I came in, we were able to make some changes and really wanted to have a board that helped double down in my skill sets or provided skill sets that I felt I needed help with. And you know, we wanted to make sure we had digital expertise on the board, which we didn't when I got to Nutrisystem we um, added some retail expertise. So these were things that as a CEO, I found helpful. So when I was looking at board opportunities, I wanted to, it's very easy to be on a board that meets four times in a year. I personally don't find a lot of value in that. I want to earn the place as a CEO's trusted advisor because that's where the CEO gets his or her most value. And that has to be earned. You don't just show up and have that. Um, so really when I join a board, I try to, I think I, what I bring to the table is having sat in the seat before, which can sometimes you have to be careful. That's not an overplayed strength because then you can, you know, be too preachy and not enough about advising. Right. So really, really careful about that. And then it's about, you know, bringing the functional expertise. And, and I always try to bring a cultural element to the board because I do believe one of the good things that's happened in the boardroom over the last couple of years is when you talk about people and talent, um, it used to be about compensation and maybe CEO succession or leadership succession. Now, you know, there are so many conversations about talent and, and the workforce that boards and culture, and I, I'm a big believer that culture is the foundation for success and setting that right culture. So I try to bring that to the table and make sure that the CEO has a deliberate path or vision on that, because otherwise it just happens with unintended consequences. Yeah, that's certainly true. If you are not intentional about it, it, it all right. happens around you. Um, exactly. and interest, interesting that uh, that even at the size and scale of, of large public companies, um, you know, the board is, is feeling uh, the need to oversee management in terms of culture. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that's intuitive or obvious. So that's, that's good to hear. You know, I think what happened over the last couple of years with the pandemic, you know, everybody learned to work from home. Then you have the, you know, the quiet quitting, you have the great resignation, you have, you know, you might have great players, but they're not bringing the culture forward. And when, you know, one of the things I did, I, I, I went up to Harvard for a couple of, um, weeks and studied, you know, a lot of board case studies in one of the courses they offered, which was just mind expanding for me. You never want to be that Wall Street Journal headline as a board, as a company. And the number one reason you are is because there's a culture breakdown. That's right. Yeah. You're right. So for, for sure. me, it's I mean, really, it's a, really and fraud, like fraud, which is what brings down a lot of companies and their boards is a culture breakdown. Right. Exactly. So you always want to make sure you have a handle on that. Yeah. So um, if I think about the boards you're on and I think about the uh, phrase you just said of Wall Street Journal headlines, Spirit Air mm -hmm. comes to mind. Uh, That's spirit. Uh -huh. Obviously, Spirit's been, uh, you know, been through a lot over the last few years. The pandemic was, you know, a nightmare for airlines, um, mm -hmm. all the M&A activity. Um, obviously, there's some things you can't talk about. I don't want you to be uncomfortable with the question, but I, the question more sort of general or abstract is in those situations, the high publicity, high pressure situations, everyone stops flying and you're running an airline, uh, right? Or volume has dropped by 90%, um, or there's a takeover bid. How does, what, what's the role of the board at that point relative to the role of the CEO or the general counsel or the outside counsel, or the CFO? Um, you know, how, how in it are boards when there's something really significant uh, of profile going on? 
Yeah, I, I would say Spirit Airlines, great board, great management team. And a lot has happened, not just to Spirit, but across the industry, again, with certainly with the pandemic and, and the CARES Act and then not passengers not flying. Um, I think we've weathered it well. Um, we, we then um, had a little love tri triangle going on between Frontier and Spirit that JetBlue then inserted itself in. And you know we're in the process of actually going through a sales process with JetBlue that is awaiting Department of Justice approval. Um, but, but it's interesting and, and the board does get involved in those situations because CEOs can't you know, buy or sell companies on their own, which is good. You know? So the board is very involved in those sort of decisions. And it's always about looking out for the fiduciary duty of all shareholders and it's complicated and you need to have the right set of advisors in there and right you probably you probably bring it at least for the uh, merger you're bringing in a lot of external advisors presumably the pandemic maybe some health related advisors uh, yeah pandemic's different a sale company always have the advisors in there and you know there's a lot of moving parts to it and it's about ultimately doing what's what you believe is the ultimate right move for the shareholders and you know the shareholders will tell you along the way what they're thinking as well so um, you know, sometimes it gets played out publicly, sometimes it, it does not. But, you know, when it comes to, you know, I said earlier, you know, you don't really want to be the Wall Street Journal headline. And I, I think in all situations, you know, you, you want to manage things. You don't want to create distractions for the company and the leadership. So the best that you can do to just do what's right for the company, do what's right for the shareholders, stay out of the headlines is always, to me, the best approach. With that being said, when you do get in the headlines, you need to be know how to handle that and to take all emotion out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, on a board also, I, I think boards also need to be disciplined and, and the discipline has to be exerted on, on the part of the company about not going rogue and not speaking to the press, you know, uh, unless, the, unless the company has cleared it and is advising it and you're on message and everything else. Presumably that's an issue that comes up in these situations too. Right, that's correct. And yes, the board uh, generally, the what I've always done and what most of my companies have done is it's the CEO and CFO and then the chairman of the board that talk to investors or talk, you know, on articles and things like on to journalists and things like that. The board in general is always no comment. Yeah, I mean, it has that's to just be. the discipline. You need one voice, you need one strategy, and you need one person in charge. Yeah. And that should be the CEO. Uh, all right, Don, one last question before we wrap up. If you had to give um, CEOs and founders one piece of advice for scaling themselves up as leaders, um, right? A lot of our clients, you know, are running 10 person companies or Series A companies or Series B companies and look at people like you who've been successful as, as scaled public CEOs. Um, one piece of advice for that audience about scaling themselves up as a leader delegate and elevate. So it's about having the right team around you and being able to empower them to do what they need to do so you can go on and do the things that you need to do as a CEO, which is different than when you were number two in the company. And as you grow as a CEO, you need to make sure that that, that team is in place and you need to learn to let go a little bit, especially as a founder, you're used to owning it all, it's your baby. And you need to be able to, you know, let some aunts and uncles in to, you know, take care of the kids as they grow up. <laughs> Love that. Delegate and elevate. Uh, Don Zier, board member, mentor, coach, advisor. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Matt. Have a great day.